Hello friends, Jerry Rosa here at the Rosa String Works Workshop and we have a relatively old uh, vintage type Gibson A style mandolin. Uh, don't see no label in it, uh, don't see a serial number on the back of the peg head. Um, yeah, I can't really tell you much more than what you see here about it. Seen a lot of these over the years. The tuning keys are just about, the, the buttons on them are just about shot. Um, as a matter of fact, they're shot in my opinion. They're all shrunk up and shriveled up tight. Uh, I think you can see that plastic is de uh, degraded on them quite a bit. The keys themselves probably are fine. The uh, story that I have on this mandolin goes like this. This was uh, apparently the customer's father's Gibson A style mandolin. He purchased it new in the 40s, he said. He played it when I was a child. That's uh, coming from the customer. He had uh, someone cut the top down in order to improve the sound. It cracked and he never played it again. I am a mandolin player myself and I would like to have this mandolin in playable condition. That's the story. That's as much as I know. I gotta be honest, the story doesn't ring true to me. It may be, you know, it's one of those deals based on certain facts, but I don't think that's the whole story. Here's why. Um, the cracks that I see are in the back. Now, cutting the top down would have zero, at least in my opinion, to cracking the back. It would have zero to do with that. Uh, cutting the top down should never cause the back to crack. You know, I, I can't picture a scenario where that would be the case. So that doesn't make sense first. Okay, the next problem I see is that someone did repair the cracks in the back, um, but, you know, they did it through the sound hole, I'm sure, and they put little cleats in there, diamond-shaped cleats, and, you know, it's okay. It's not, it's not a great repair by any stretch, but on the other hand, it's probably fine. Um, these cracks I don't think are going to affect the mandolin at all, but there is something that will affect the mandolin, and it's far worse. And that's inside. This brace, there's a brace that runs across the back all the way across here, and I think you can see it through that sound hole and see it through this sound hole. That brace on this side for sure is loose. Absolutely 100% loose. I can see it. The mandolin is filled with dust, so I can't see well into it because it's just full of dust. I'm going to go take it to the air compressor first thing, and I'm going to blow it out so I can see inside here better and see if I can get a better assessment of what's going on. It's difficult to see inside this because it has the F holes, and it's, uh, you know, it's just a mandolin. It's, it's a thin body. I can't get much inside there to look around, but I've got some small mirrors and we'll see if we can take a better look. I found out a couple of things on this old Gibson mandolin. Um, nothing earth shattering yet. There's a, a little bit of cracking going on right here. I'm not sure what's caused that. You know, like it's pulled forward just a hair there. I can tell that the base of the tailpiece has been replaced. This is a new base. The lid appears to be original. So I, they've kept the original lid, but this piece is different. And the reason I know that, for a couple of reasons, number one, it looks different. Um, it's uh, cheap chrome versus the old nickel plating or whatever this was. And, the, uh, it, and maybe it's just a difference in chrome plating. I, I'm no expert in that all that kind of stuff and I don't keep track, as I've mentioned, I don't keep track of the historical part of this, whether this was nickel or chrome. So, you know, whether you want to email me on that or not, I don't care. But anyway, the, uh, the part here, you can see there's two holes and so the new one doesn't line up with the old holes. That's another reason I know for sure this has been replaced. So anyway, um, and well, actually even these holes don't line up very well, the two side holes. 
I've looked inside and it is very hard to see up on the top of this. Uh, even using my little inspection mirrors, I, it's very hard to see. But what I can see does not appear to have been recarved. It all looks perfectly factory smooth. You know, it may have been recarved. I don't know. I can't say for sure, but it doesn't look like it to me. Now here's something that does look very odd, very curious. If you look right here on the top, there's a hole there that where the bridge used to be. There's a hole there, and they've been patched. Now looking inside there, um, I don't see those holes, but it's probably because I can't see them with this and the light in it. I'm going to have to get a tiny light or something, get inside there and see if I can see those holes from the inside and, and maybe I'll get a clue as to what's going on with that. Okay, I've determined what these two holes or uh, what appear to be holes are. They're not holes. What they actually are are the indentions where apparently at some point in time the screw that is adjusters had gone through the bridge and just punched little indentions in the top and those have been filled. I can tell that for sure because there's no hole on the inside. I, I am sure I've looked at the right spot in both places and there's nothing going all the way through the top. So those are just indentions and I'm sure they're from where the bridge adjusters have gone through the bridge feet at some point and uh, into the top there. The bridge appears to be a different bridge than original. I'll show you that bridge. I recognize this bridge as either a Stumac bridge or um, one of the old German bridges, bef I don't know, that Stumac used to carry. Anyway, it's definitely not this bridge that caused the problem. There was a bridge before this that caused those indentions there. So that's what that is. I see nothing wrong with the top on this. My opinion right now it could be strung up and probably be just fine now I may get fooled once we do that but right now that's what it looks like it looks to me like I could string it up and it would be fine uh, the only issue is that back brace and it is definitely loose um, I sincerely doubt you can see that in here uh, you can see the brace but I doubt you'll be able to tell that it's loose uh, let me see if I can get the camera at the right angle there you might be able to see it with manipulating the light in the right direction. Yeah, there you can. I think you can see that the end of the brace there is actually up. So off the back. It's up for a ways there. You can see where the old glue is squeezed out and cracked. I think you can see that. So that has to be fixed for sure. These cracks here it wouldn't hurt if they were fixed, but I'm not too worried about them, to be honest with you, as long as they're not vibrating. I do still hear something, oh, I'm, that's the tuning keys. Duh. I don't hear anything vibrating as I tap on the body. Um, so just that one brace is probably loose and it doesn't appear to be vibrating. It actually appears that someone tried to fix it years ago. I'm going to reach in there and see if I can move it around. What I'm going to do is take this screwdriver and I'm going to see if I can push it up and down. Yep, it definitely goes up and down. And the problem is it's further off the back there than you think it is. Uh, it's quite a bit way. It's quite a bit of the ways off of the back. Let me see. Let's try again and see. It doesn't show up very well how far it is off the back. I would say it's close to, well it's at least a sixteenth of an inch. I would say it's at least a sixteenth of an inch from touching the back. I can't force it down and get it to the back. Let's put it that way without breaking something. It feels like it's going to break something if I push it down all the way. It really feels that hard. It definitely is quite a ways off of the back. That bothers me a lot. What I'm going to try to do, since it is right below the sound hole, I'm going to try to devise an L-shaped flat blade that I can go in there and clean out under that brace. Maybe there's just some old dried glue stuck there and won't let the brace go down. Maybe we'll get lucky and that's the problem. Well, if you're a fan of my videos or if you've watched a lot of my videos, I would say that one of the key things is creative clamping. And you've probably seen that many times. Well, that's another situation. That's what we have here. 
I have a post sticking down on top of that brace and of course I've got the clamp on the back side with leather and I have I just taken my time and squeezed it down until the brace is on the back so it's dry right now I don't have any glue in there I just wanted to make sure that I could get a clamp on it and get it tightened down to the back now um, and I might just add I off camera I took this little thin bladed knife I bent the blade on it and I reached in through the bottom uh, to, through the largest part of the sound hole I reached in there and went underneath that brace to make sure there weren't any big lumps of glue or something like that in there um, so it does seem to be made it up pretty well to the back. I'm trying to see if by pressing that side down did the other side change and I don't see any change in the other side so I'm hoping the other side is okay. We will check it later after we get this side glued down real well. So that's what I'm going to do now is find a way to get glue under that brace. Here we go. I've drawn a little bit of tight bond glue into the syringe. I'm going to stick down through the big hole I can get to the brace fairly well and I'm going to just squirt what little bit of glue I have in this thing under there it's not working real well I gotta be honest because this glue is very thick it's very hard to get it up inside the syringe I hate to water it down so I'm just trying to use it thick I'm getting it in there, but not real well. I think I'm just going to try a paintbrush. I think that'll actually get me in there a little bit better and just makes a little bit bigger mess is all. Yeah, that's doing much better. I can get right under there with that. I had a little bit bigger needle on the syringe, but then the needle wouldn't go under there very well if I had a bigger needle, so it's kind of a six and one half, half dozen in the other problem. This is working real good. I'm getting real good glue under there now. I can tell. It's even coming through the other side. I can see the paintbrush coming through the other side. And I'm trying to work it up into the middle as far as I can. I can tell somebody else has already tried to fix this once. And that always makes it tougher. But apparently they're, they didn't do a very good job of getting the glue under there. Mostly their glue is out on the out on the back you can see where they missed the mark if you will I can see my glue getting all the way under the bra uh, brace going through all the way to the other side so I know I'm getting coverage under there more is more is better in this case so I'm just gonna keep putting it in there till I know I've got it everywhere I'm going to try to go from the other side up towards the middle. I'm not getting all the way under there as well as I would like, although I can see it coming through on this side. But I'm going to try getting in from this side a little bit too. Maybe it'll just help it a little bit more. I believe we're covered pretty well. I think I feel comfortable that that's going to hold. I'm going to clamp it in place, then I'm going to try to clean up what glue I can. I'm going to put a little beeswax on the end of this so it won't stick in case there's a little bit of glue there. I take this beeswax and, and just rub the, the end of the brace that's going to go on top of the brace with this wax. I thought is that the glue won't stick to it that way. I don't think it's enough glue there to worry about, but there could be a little bit there. And now we've got to manipulate this whole thing, get the brace on the back very good good squeeze out all the way around the very tip the very tip down here is not on the back very well so I'm gonna have to find some way to wedge in there and get that glued down but before I worry about that I'm gonna get the, some of the glue squeeze out cleaned up I've got some warm water here dipping the paintbrush in the water and I'm reaching in there and I'm just wiping over the top of the glue that squeezed out. That looks pretty good. I think we got a pretty good job there. Now I'm going to figure out some way to get 
some kind of clamp back here. I don't know how I'm going to do that. I, I got to be honest, that's not simple. Um, just have to see what I can come up with. If I come up with anything, I'll let you know. Okay, I, what I did was I found a dowel here that actually fits through the hole, fit, wedges and gets on top of that brace, pushes it down a little bit. To be perfectly honest with you, it's still not all the way down, but I don't think it's going to go any further. I take a screwdriver, reach through, push down on it, and I could not make it go down. So it's down as far as it's physically going to go, and uh, we will just let it sit like this for you know the next couple hours, and probably really 24 hours, and then I think we're good to go. It's been uh, 24 hours plus. I took the clamp off of the inside brace here and it's good. I'm just going to tap around and see if I hear anything else. Top brace sounds solid. I don't hear anything. I'm holding the I'm holding the tuning keys to keep them from rattling. I don't hear anything. Incidentally, whenever you see me tap on these things, I see other people mimic what I'm doing and they're hitting it with their fingernails. First of all, I don't have much fingernails. Second of all, I'm hitting it with the fleshy part of my fingers. So just so you understand that, there's a big difference in what I see happen sometimes. I don't see any problem. Now, cosmetically, we've got these big scratch or big cracks through here and literally I if I hold it up like this and I look through this side of the F hole I can see daylight through those cracks so they're not good they've got cleats on them on the inside I don't think there's much we can do about fixing those what I think I'll try doing is taping them off from this side literally taping right against the crack and I think I'll just let super glue or some kind of glue flow down in that crack, probably super glue, and uh, then I'll remove the tape, and then and then we'll just smooth that out the best we can, and that'll fill those uh, the voids that are in there because there are definitely some voids in there. And uh, other than that, uh, I mean, I'll have to talk to the customer about these tuning keys because these tuning keys, at least the buttons, are completely gone. I think the action on the keys themselves would probably be fine, but the keys themselves are just toast. They're so tiny, it's hard to really show how tiny they are. There's my little finger and they're, they're shrunk much more than my little fingers. So they're very little and uh, very hard to turn because of that. So after we just address this and address this, I think we're ready to string it up. I'm going to look at the truss rod in the Gibson. It looks like it should be fine, but you never know until you open them up to see what you might find. Um, the neck looks straight, so I don't see a problem. I'm not looking for a problem. I'm just making sure that there is no problem. And every once in a while you open these things up and you find something you don't expect. And it looks to be fine. I'm just going to check how snug it is. got a very tiny nut on it. I just snugged it just a fraction just to make sure it doesn't vibrate. I think we're fine there. I don't see a problem. It turned so I don't think there's any issues. There is some fret wear on this old fretboard. I'm going to level it and recrown it real quickly so it won't take very much to do that. I'm not going to film it. Well, I said I wasn't going to film the leveling of these frets but I have run into a problem here and I can, I can identify the problem as I look down the neck. Uh, there is a little bit more underbow here than it needs. These frets are extremely high on the end and I'm, I'm cutting a lot of off material off of these and I'm cutting some material off of here. Almost nothing off of here. So I think I am going to take the truss rod cover back off again and tighten it just a hair more to see if we can get rid of a little bit more of that underbow because it's it's in my opinion it's a little more than it needs I would say that's a little better but it's probably still a little bit more than it needs I'm gonna turn it around here and try to put a little bit more crank on it not a lot because you can break them that's better for sure it's got the short neck too, so you know it, it, it's harder to bend that short neck. It takes more force. 
So now I'm gonna just see if that feels any better on filing. We're, we're starting to touch them now in these low, low lying frets here. As I've said before, it takes years for an instrument to get in the shape that it's in. This underbow has been pulled in there for years. It's hard to just say, I'm going to pull it out of there right now because that wood is pretty thick wood and you're, you know, you're pulling against a lot of stress. So, you know, it's good to tighten it up a little bit and, and uh, I, you know, I don't think I should go much tighter than I've already gone. Just a little bit there and I think we're about as good as we should do on this mandolin for now. Maybe the next time it get, comes in for a fret job, we'll tighten it up a little bit more. Maybe we can get some more out of it. But I really think you can do damage you know, to an instrument. An old instrument, they're just set in their ways is the best way to explain it. And, and they really are. Uh, it takes a long time for them to fold into that shape they're folded into. And to think you can just change that shape overnight, it takes a long time. So here we go. We're going to recrown it and string her up. I'm going to uh, oil this fretboard with some boiled linseed oil, but before I do that, I'm going to clean this top. The top is kind of grimy, as Randy Schardiger would say. It's a little covered with DNA, and I'm going to just more or less just wash it down with a damp cloth and try to clean it up as best I can. Then, while I'm oiling this, I'm going to put some of that oil into these heavy scratches and kind of That'll just make the finish blend a lot better, make it look a lot better. Well, I noticed I washed the whole thing down with this damp cloth. And the good news is it came clean pretty well. The bad news is, as I'm doing that, I'm noticing something else that I wouldn't have noticed otherwise. There's a fine finish crack right around here, which indicates to me that that neck might be cracked slightly. And it goes quite a ways back into here. Um, on this side, it just kind of angles down across here. There appears to have been some sort of mild trauma right here, if you can see that. And that's right off of that crack. I just wonder if it got, you know, dropped or something and something popped it right there. It does look like there's a slight crack in the neck. Now, I'm not going to lie to you, I tightened up the truss rod a little bit. I didn't go crazy tightening the truss rod up. I tightened it up pretty snug, you know, trying to pull some of this underbow out of the neck. I don't think that would crack it because that's pulling the opposite way. In other words, that's pulling it up this way. It's not pushing it down this way. If I was pushing it down that way, that would crack that. This should actually pull the crack back together by tightening the truss rod. So I don't think that tightening the truss rod had anything to do with this. I just think I noticed it because I'm washing the whole instrument down. I think it's been there all along. I didn't hear anything break as I'm tightening the truss rod, by the way. I mean, nothing, because I didn't tighten it that much. But anyway, I don't know what to do about that. I, I, it's way too tight to even think about get glue in it. It's no, I don't, and I don't know if I can see any movement. I don't think I can see any movement there. But I do think it might be a crack. It's almost like you took and scratched it around there. But it sure does make me think there's something going on there. I have to be honest. It does make me think there's a problem. Just washing all the crud off of it is how I saw it. I, I'm just washing it like this and I go, boy, that looks like a crack. And sure enough, I think it is. But I'm serious, when I tell you about getting glue in it, it's impossible. It's not that kind of crack. The crack is, I'm trying to point to it right on video, right there. It's that line. It's just a fine line. There's no opening. And those, and those two little marks there is where I think the trauma might have happened. I'll put strings on it. If I see that open up, then we will address it at that time. But right now, I don't see anything that I can do for that. I wish I would have filmed these scratches here as I'm putting the linseed oil on them. They just literally, literally disappeared. Um, you know, they didn't when I first rubbed it on there, but after I rubbed it and rubbed it and rubbed it, the cracks, the scratches just literally disappeared. This is much deeper. That's not going to happen on this where the pick has been scratching this for years or whatever that is. But uh, it, 
if I see another spot here that I think will go away, I'll try to point it out. These scratches are too light. I don't think they're going to go away, but they might. There you go. Yeah, they just did. They just did. They just went away, literally. These scratches here, if you can see them, here's the before. And let's see if we can make them go away. You have to rub it into it. You have to really get the linseed oil down in the crack. And they literally just about make them go completely away, at least in some cases. Looks much better. You can still see it a little bit, depending on the light. But overall, from across the room, you can't see it at all. Where you could before, because it was lighter. Putting linseed oil on your old finishes like this does not hurt anything, that's for sure. And, uh, you know, I just wipe it on real hit like this and just rub it in real good. It, it cleans uh, the stuff that's there, too. I mean, it cleans off a lot of old junk. It fills in those cracks and things. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't put it on a crack that you want to glue, because then you won't be able to glue it. Don't do that. But just scratches, you know, all these little scra surface scratch cracks type things, it really does a nice job for that. Makes the instrument look like it's been really well cared for. After you get it on there, give it a few minutes and just wipe it right back off. Well, I've decided on these cracks, I'm going to force just plain old wood glue into the cracks. And the reason I'm not going to use um, the instant glues is just simply because of the finish. This won't affect the finish at all. Those other ones will, and, and it's a curved surface. If it was flat, I'd probably go ahead and use super glue, but because it's um, you know a curved surface, it will be very difficult to put the super glue on and get it back off and make it smooth. You know, so I'm just going to use plain old wood glue, force it down into these cracks. Um, I can't do much more than that on this particular case because, like I said, they're already cleated from the inside. So I'm not going to try to do much more than this. I'm just putting the glue in there to fill the gaps, and that will, this I have very good confidence in this glue, it will uh, keep it from cracking further, it will make it strong. I'm forcing it down in there with my finger. And uh, I'm going to do the same thing to this little crack here and this little crack here. I don't know that these other two cracks are big enough to get glue down in. The big one there, the big crack was. Yeah, this one here is taking glue too. And now I will wet, I've got a wet rag here, now that I think about it. And I'll just wipe across it like this so that I'm not wiping it out of the grain, out of the crack. You can still see the white glue down in the crack there, I think. So that should fill it and it should be good. Now I'll just take a dry towel and wipe it off this way. I'm not actually wiping in the crack now, I'm wiping parallel to it. Any extra residue out. That looks good. I'll let that dry a while and uh, that way it won't affect the finish, but yet it'll seal that crack up really well. While I was waiting on parts for this, I took a couple of days hiatus from the shop and uh, was working on the sawmill. It's not that I didn't have other shop work to do. I've got other instruments sitting here too, but every once in a while you just need to take a little bit of a break. And that's what I did. And I worked on my sawmill. And uh, we'll have a video on the sawmill coming up fairly soon. Right now, we've got some new tuning keys for this baby and to replace these tuning keys. These tuning keys will be returned to the customer so that he can keep them original with the uh, mandolin. But uh, they are really shot in terms of the buttons. They're just, just really bad. And uh, you can see the difference. And hopefully you can even see the difference in the size of the buttons there. So there's, you know, they have shrunk considerably. So let's get these going. These came from Stumac. They're the, uh, I think they're called the Golden Age or something like that tuning keys. And uh, I'm hoping they're going to fit up. I haven't checked them yet. As you can tell, I'm just taking them out of the bag right now. So we'll see how it goes. I went ahead and fitted these up off camera. 
just to uh, make sure they fit. Uh, main reason is I just didn't want you all to see a grown man cry if they didn't fit. I'm going to leave the old original ferrules in there. Um, it's not that they're hard to remove or anything. I could take them out. There's no problem. It's just that I think that just gives it that better look. You know, I think they look original and I think they still go with the new ones. And uh, rather than put the newer ones in there, I think that just looks better. So we're going to go with that. That way you only see the shiny looking stuff when you turn it over. It, uh, it kind of looks like this matches the way it is. So I'm going with that. And the screw holes sort of match up, but they're not perfectly matched. Um, i got to be honest, they're just a little bit off. The bottom screw hole seems to match up pretty good. The second screw hole matches up about, oh, 66%. And this one matches up about 33 or about 50%. So it's you know it progressively gets a little worse as you go up to the end here. These these are cutting the hole in half. And these are two thirds of the hole is available, I guess. And then uh, this one here is pretty well available. So I'm also just going to stick some toothpicks in those holes, a little glue and toothpicks because those holes are kind of wallered out. And uh, I'm not going to film all that either because there's no point in it. We'll just do that and put it all back together we'll bring you back when we get her set up. I've got all the holes completely filled with uh, as tight as I could get it with toothpicks and glue. Um, I re the Regal Rec Restoration uh, customer sent me a really nice care package with a lot of little small type tools that you use in the shop. One of them is these little drill stops. In other words, uh, you put this around your drill bed and it will only go in so deep. But actually, the smallest one is actually still a little large for this particular application. Number one, the drill bit is tiny and it's short. Um, I was going to go ahead and just chuck it on the outside of this, but even then, this is too big around to fit in the tight spacing in between here. I've already checked it. it it'll fit most of them, but it, there's a couple that won't fit. And because of that, I just decided to skip it. So I went ahead and put tape on here for a depth stop. And uh, I'm going to try to re-drill these holes now and uh, see how that goes. Try to get them in the center as best I can. As a matter of fact, I'm going to take a punch and pre-punch the center to try to help guide it down the center a little bit better. It's difficult whenever you're drilling where there's already a hole because it does not want to change. It wants to follow that hole. So we'll see what happens. Oh, these have the uh, straight slot screws. The new, they don't have Phillips, they have straight heads, straight slots. So let's see if we've got something that'll work with that. That worked out real well. Everything went in straight and tight. And uh, we still got all the old ferrules there. And I believe we're ready to get started putting her, stringing her back up. We'll see how it goes. Might point out that the holes back here are pretty wrecked out also. And um, I don't like to leave stuff like that. So we're going to fill these holes as best we can, re-drill them and put the tailpiece back on. Just pointing out that those holes now have been filled. They were very large, much bigger than I thought, and it took three to four toothpicks per hole to fill all that. So uh, we're going to now. I broke them all off, and now I'm going to take my little plane blade, and I'm going to just cut them off smooth with the surface there. Just a delicate little uh, operation. I didn't drill these because the holes were so big and I've got them packed full of toothpicks. The toothpicks are soft enough you can screw right into them and they tighten up real good. I'm also looking down this and making sure that these are in the same plane and they look good. Um, 
where the old holes were. They look pretty good. So I'm going to uh, go ahead and punch those. Put the screws back in there too. There's no evidence of a strap button ever being installed on this. I don't know, you know, what the customer thinks about that. I'm inclined to put a strap button on here, but I will check with the customer first since it doesn't have one and never has had one. It doesn't appear. We'll check with him and see what he wants to do about that. I talked to the customer via email and he does want a strap button on here. So we're going to put that on here. Whenever I'm going to put in a screw in a, in a hard wood or something on an instrument, especially an old instrument, I like to wax the screw first. It goes in much easier. I just take a little beeswax like this and just rub it across the threads and uh, that picks up enough of the wax that it just makes the screw drive much, much easier. One strap button installed. Just getting ready to mount the bridge on this Gibson and I noticed the bridge was leaning forward a little bit. Part of the problem is the end of the feet you can possibly see that it's beveled. It's thicker down here at this end than it is at this end. I also noticed that uh, the feet don't match the top very well. So we have the perfect opportunity to straighten this back up, back like this, and get the feet to touch the top. So that's what we're gonna do. I've actually been sanding on this for a little while now. And uh, it's getting closer. You can see that it's starting to make a fairly large black mark there where it's uh, touching pretty good. I am putting back pressure on this so that I'm cutting it off the back side of the bridge mostly. As I mentioned, I think this is definitely a replacement bridge and saddle. This is not the original. I can tell absolutely for sure. I'm going to see what it looks like now just by eye when I lay it on here. Setting a little straighter, although it's, start, it's, it's got a little bit of a rock to it from the front to the back because of what we're doing. I'm going to check to see if there's a lot of light underneath it when I hold it up like this. It's looking pretty good. There's a little bit of light in some places. Most of the light is underneath the end of this particular foot here. And I believe that's all going to come out as we work on the sanding part of this. I believe that's about as close as we're going to get it. The top's got a little bit of deformation in it. I don't know if we're going to run into problems when we string it up or not. The customer had a question about it and uh, thought it had been recarved, but I don't see any evidence of that. So I don't know. We'll just see. It really sits nice now. It's nice and solid there. It's still probably got a hair of a lean forward, but not bad like it was. It was really bad on leaning forward before. It's definitely improved. I can't remember if the customer wanted a deer antler saddle or not. I have to look that up. The customer made no mention on the deer antler saddle. I'm going to go ahead and string it up with this traditional saddle. This old, mainly because it's an old Gibson. You know, if it were something new, I'd probably go ahead and put the deer antler saddle on it. But because it's old, I, you know, I'm trying to keep that traditional look. And uh, we'll just leave it that way for right now and see what it sounds like. If I get her strung up and it sounds like it could benefit from the uh, antler saddle, well, then we'll put one of those on there. I chose the uh, A270s for this mandolin, which is basically the same thing as a J74 in the Diodario. The A270s is GHS, and I say the same thing. They're for sure the same gauge, and they're made out of the same materials. So the, they're 11, uh, 16, 26, and 40. And um, they're phosphor bronze and steel, so they're basically the same string in my opinion. There's very little difference. I don't know that very many people would be able to tell the difference in sound. Um, I certainly could not. I know that. The uh, 
action on this, and I don't have the strings tightened up yet, the action on this is very high. Um, the the 18 thousandths pick would not stay there at all. It would just fall out, and you can see that. So the action's very high. We're going to work on this end first. This action is on the edge of high back here. So we're going to work on this first and see where this is at. We may have to do some work on the saddle and take the saddle down a little bit. Thought I'd give you a little close up of the action. You can see now that these literally do not move when you press on them. And maybe you can see that this one does move, how high it is, see. These others were that high before, but they're very high. Uh, keep in mind, the pick is 18 thousandths, and I've measured the pick many times. I know it's exactly 18 thousandths. I would say it's twice as high as it should be, and the same way with this one here, too. So we're going to work on those and bring them down as well. I've taken the time and gotten the action just exactly right. It's very low now. One thing you will notice is that the strings are down inside the nut pretty deeply. This is a bone nut and I'm going to take the strings out of here now. They're not really up to tension yet anyway. I'm just going to take, lift them out of here and I'm going to file this off down so that the strings are kind of riding about halfway down in this slot. Um, I might also add that one of the key problems with this particular nut was that the string slots were way too narrow. You put the string down in there, even on the, on the little solid steel strings, and once they went down in there under tension, you couldn't lift them back out, even after you took the tension off. They just would stick. So anyway, that problem's been fixed as well. So now we're going to file that nut down. Rounding off the back side of the nut there, and now I'm going to take and just, the, the bottom side of this is smooth, and I'm going to lay that sort of against the fretboard there, although I'm not really putting any pressure on it, and I'm going to um, just knock the very sharp edge off the back of the nut here. Okay, that's much better. Took off quite a bit. Strings don't look like they're so far down in the slot now. Looking pretty good, double checking the action here to make sure nothing's changed. I don't think it should, but looks good. All right, we're gonna file this other side a little bit. That looks real good. All right, we're gonna tune her up and see what it feels like. One more thing before we tune it up I'm going to do is if you look here the strings are pretty narrow on the fretboard. In other words there's a lot of fretboard showing here and here and um, we can make use of that and spread this out just a little bit. We can also spread these strings out here and what really made me notice that more was the fact that these are in kind of tight on this saddle. I like to spread the sound out across the top. And uh, if you can concentrate it all in one little spot, you know, I think it sounds uh, a lot more sh harsh, if you will. If you can spread it out, I think it, it, you know, it broadens the sound. It lets that vibration get across the top, I think, a little better. It separates the strings a little bit more. It's just my own theory. I don't know that that's 100%, but it sure does seem like it. It works that way on fiddles, it seems to me, and it seems to me to work that way better on mandolins as well. In my opinion, these strings are just too crunched together, so we're going to spread them out just a little bit. And I'm going to take the saddle off to do that because the action back here is just a little bit high, so I'm going to take a little bit off the bottom of each of these saddle, of the saddle. Uh, this saddle is plenty thick this way, so we don't have to worry about uh, losing any strength across there. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to sand a little bit of the top of this off to try to get rid of the uh, old string grooves because we're not going to use those anymore. We're going to spread them out a little bit. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to be able to get rid of all of it. Might be able to. I'm afraid I'm going to sand the holes through. I'd, I'd prefer to keep the, the top here solid where there's no holes showing, but it's not that big a deal. Lots of mandolins have the holes showing, so it's not that big a deal. But ah, I just got rid of it. Well, there's one mark little just lightly showing, but that's not that big a deal. So we're just going to call that good. 
Now I'm going to file away some of this here uh, to reduce the thickness of this. Um, that already did reduce it a little bit, but that's not going to be enough. So I'm going to take some more off the bottom here and uh, to be able to get this down a little bit lower to lower the action just a little bit. Okay, now I'm just checking to make sure I've got it what looks square to my eye. You know, I don't want it uh, sloping or anything, and I don't want it sloping in any direction. I want it square in all directions. It looks pretty good. Um, basically, what I did was I took it down to the thickness of this file so that the, the plane across here is the same. So that way I can have a gauge across here. Now, this it's, it's definitely uh, higher on this side, so we're going to take it down to the same depth. That looks good. I think we've got our mission accomplished. Now I'm going to just knock off these sharp edges around the top edge there. The spreading out there was fairly subtle, but is definitely different. And uh, now we will tune her up and see if she's holding and everything's stable and if she sounds how she sounds. This little old Gibson A style mandolin with no serial number that I can find is in very good shape. Uh, got it all tuned up, the intonation's just right, the action is absolutely perfect, butter perfect. Um, it holds a pick at the seventh fret just barely. I mean it, it doesn't, you know, it's not lifting the strings, it just slides in there perfect. And uh, up here of course the heavy pick wouldn't even start under there now. Um, the, uh, it seems stable, you know, this is the, the uh, original complaint with this mandolin was that the customer said he believed his father had sent it off had it recarved on the inside and that it was not stable anymore and it was cracking and breaking and that kind of thing so he never played it anymore okay sure there are definitely cracks on the back here I do not think that would have anything at all to do with recarving the top even if the top was recarved I see no evidence inside that the top was recarved. I see no evidence that it was taken apart so that the top could be recarved. Um, there's only two things that give me any pause at all on this mandolin. One of them is back here. There's some, uh, and you can't see it now because of the tailpiece, but there was some little crunched up uh, area where it felt like, it, like maybe this, this block had pulled forward a little bit. I don't see a problem with it under tension right now. It seems fine, so I think we're okay. The top seems fine. I mean, the only other place that gives me a little pause is these cracks, but I don't think they're a problem now. I've glued the brace back across the inside there, across the back, and I've also put glue down in these cracks and it's had several days to dry, so I don't think they're going to do anything further. The only other thing that gives me some pause, and it's just minor right now, is that little crack in the in the neck here and uh, I can't really tell if it's deep into the neck or not you can't hardly feel it at all um, you can see it so um, that there would make me want to watch that other than that I see nothing wrong with this mandolin um, the other thing I observation I think that you know I know there's a lot of historians out there that really like to know things about these mandolins well, if you notice something maybe unique about the peg head, um, it's different than most, and that is that it's thicker here and it tapers down really narrow down here. And I don't see that very often. Um, as a matter of fact, see, you can see this tuning post is much higher, I think you can, than this tuning post. And on this side, this is much higher than this one uh, uh, compared to the top of the mandolin because the top, you know, it is, it is, wedge-shaped. It gets thinner as it goes out to the end. I just thought I'd point that out. I thought that was kind of unique. The other thing that uh, if you're looking to buy a mandolin, I mean this great old Gibson mandolin is a great mandolin. Most people these days would like to have a mandolin with a longer neck. This has what I call the short neck. It's attached at the 12th body fret um, right in here and Let's see, we got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, yes. So we call that attached at the 12th fret. The modern uh, mandolins now are attached at the 15th fret. That gives you that longer neck, that longer scale. 
and uh, that's a lot easier to play in my opinion. These get a little hard to play once you get down in here into the B and, and, and the high C and things like that. So they do have much shorter necks. So that's the only negative of this type of mandolin in my opinion. But it's got a, it's, it's, uh, it's sounding real good here. I hope you like the sound of it. I'll play it for you. Because of the uh, you know original concern about the mandolin, I'm going to keep this a day or two under string tension, uh, not ship it back right away. Keep it under string tension a day or two and check it you know each day and see if I notice any difference. I don't think I'm going to. I'm a little concerned about the neck here and uh, that little crack or whatever that could be there. Uh, it's definitely not opened up enough to do anything with it. I mean, I cannot. There's no opening there where you could get glue in or anything like that. But I'm going to watch that over the next day or two and see if anything changes and see if the action changes. Otherwise, as far as I'm concerned, it's perfect. It's really nice old mandolin. I wish we had a serial number so we could know a little bit more about it. Thank you for watching.